Our next speaker is Chris Parsons. <laughs> Chris is a member of the Aquahydrology Research Group. She, he's doing the uh, postdoctoral research in our group. And Chris finished uh, his undergrad in the geology program at the University of Manchester and his PhD in environmental geochemistry from uh, Grenoble University. His uh, research focus right now is impact of the natural driven fluctuation of redox condition in soil, sediments, and groundwater on the speciation of mobility of oxidation forming nutrients and contaminants. Yeah. Okay, can you hear me okay? <coughs> yes. Well, thanks very much for the introduction, Perrin. Uh, so I'm gonna be talking about nutrient cycling in marsh sediments in uh, Coots Paradise and particularly about the cycling of phosphorus. And usually when we talk about wetland sediments, um, we tend to think of them as nutrient sinks, uh, that external inputs uh, flow into a wetland and are then immobilized within the sediments. And I'm gonna talk about actually when that situation can be reversed and when you get nutrient contributions to surface water from the sediments. And that phenomenon is known as internal loading. So, one place where internal loading has shown to be a real problem is uh, Coots Paradise Marsh, and that's a, um, a coastal uh, wetland that flows into, first of all, Hamilton Harbour, and then eventually into the western tip of Lake Ontario. And uh, I've stolen, actually, a graph here from um, Patch Al Fraser, who I think is just, just there, uh, <laughs> uh, from some work that she did, actually, in 1998. And what we can see um, here is the phosphorus loadings to Coots Paradise Marsh as a function of time. And um, what happened is in the 19, Coots Paradise was fairly heavily abused uh, in terms of nutrient inputs in the 1960s and 1970s. And that led to, amongst other things, uh, uh, huge amounts of uh, algal growth, which were harmful for uh, the ecosystem. So there was a remedial actual action plan set up to cover Hamilton Harbor and Coots Paradise. Uh, to, and one of the points was to try and reduce the amount of phosphorus loading um, to the marsh, which was the limiting nutrient uh, for primary productivity. So as you can see, in about 1978, uh, there was improvements way to, made to a wastewater treatment plant, which resulted in a massive decrease in the amount of phosphorus going into the system. Now, if you, you would expect that if then phosphorus was limiting the algal growth, a decrease in the phosphorus would decrease the amount of algal growth. And unfortunately, that's not really what happened. And what we can see is these are photos I took in 2013, and you still have a huge problem with algal growth. And uh, some of the work that Pat Chow Fraser has done has shown that internal loading accounts for about 34% of the phosphorus uh, inputs to the surface water. But um, actually estimating those phosphorus inputs uh, from the sediment is quite complex because of the dynamic conditions in the sediment. So that's really what I'm, I'm interested in, is the dynamic geochemistry in the sediments which results in these uh, phosphorus pulses. So I sent myself a few research questions. Uh, first of all, how much legacy phosphorus is stored in the sediments uh, and under which, which form? So by form, I'm talking about the speciation with which mineral phases are, is the phosphorus associated? Does it occur as organic phosphorus? Because naturally, you would assume that if algae is taking up phosphorus into its um, cellular structure, then eventually at the end of the growing season, the algae dies and becomes part of the sediments. Does that organic pea accumulate in the sediments or not? The second question was under the dynamic conditions, uh, does the sediment mineralogy or the biological processing of the necromass, which is just the dead algae, control phosphorus release? And thirdly, bioturbation is a very important process in this system. Does that affect phosphorus speciation and mobility in sediments? So why do we care about phosphorus speciation? Well, phosphorus can be stored in many different ways in sediment, and some of them are very easily released and some of them are not. So here we have a representation of a mineral grain, doesn't really matter which mineral it is, uh, showing that if phosphorus is this red atom here, that it can be stored actually uh, within a, um, a mineral containing phosphorus, it can be occluded within that mineral, it can be absorbed to the surface, uh, or also it can exist as this um, uh, organic, these organic phosphorus species, such as phospholipid bilayers or DNA. And uh, under different conditions, these different species will be released. Um, now, quite a lot of the mineralogical controls are quite well understood for phosphorus. What's not quite so well understood is how quickly uh, organic phosphorus is converted to uh, more labile uh, inorganic uh, orthophosphate, which is the species really which algae can use to, to grow. Uh, 
So the first slide of results, um, to try and answer the question of how much phosphorus there was there and what speciation, I did a couple of things. Um, total extractions, and to quantify the phosphorus, uh, sequential extractions to see the mineralogy, and uh, P31 NMR, some spectroscopy, to determine whether it was organic phosphorus present or inorganic uh, phosphate. And as you can see, there was significant amounts of phosphorus in the sediments, uh, 1,800 milligrams per kilogram, which is very close to the severe um, effect level as uh, stipulated by the Ministry of Environment. Um, what we also see is that most of this uh, phosphorus is inorganic. There's only a few percent which is, uh, occur as organic uh, phosphorus, which is unusual considering the inputs. So I said that I wanted to see under dynamic conditions um, how internal loading, how this phosphorus uh, mobilized to the surface water is important. So one of the dynamic conditions in Coots Paradise, it's not the only one, is um, caused by bioturbation. So we analyzed the number of um, benthic macroinvertebrates uh, within the top uh, 40 centimeters uh, of uh, a sediment column and found that there were 50,000 different individuals uh, identified, which is quite a high density. Um, and that if you look at various different sediment properties, uh, there's two, two clear zones which are identified below 15 centimeters and above 15 centimeters. And this is really the depth of penetration of uh, bioturbation, how deep these organisms can burrow down to. Looking at the composition of the community, we found that it was dominated by aquatic earthworms or uh, tubifex worms. So uh, <laughs> that's uh, not my image, but it was an electron micrograph uh, taken from the internet, and that's what a tubifex worm looks like. I couldn't resist putting the googly eyes on, so please excuse my lack of professionalism there. <laughs> but basically what these things do is um, eat bacteria and other microbes in the sediment at depth, and then excrete that, uh, the remaining sediment particles out onto the surface at the sediment water interface. So conceptually, if we look at what, what's actually happening, if this is the sediment uh, water interface, we have algae which is growing on the surface and then dying and being incorporated into the sediment. We have a worm that's making a burrow, uh, ingesting sediment here uh, and excreting it here. And as this is happening, there's 50,000 of them per meter squared, you get this very complex mosaic of burrows which uh, result in a complex mosaic of redox conditions. And if we were to follow the time series path of um, redox conditions experienced by any particular soil particle, we'd see that it starts off uh, oxic, gets buried, goes reduced, oxidized, and you can see it follows more or less, more or less this uh, cyclic uh, condition here. So I wanted to simulate these chemical uh, conditions in the lab. And so what I did is uh, construct a system of redox oscillation reactors, whereby we put the top 15 centimeters of um, sediment into a suspension with a groundwater matrix uh, into a reactor, and then control um, redox conditions by sparging different gases through that suspension. So we can um, enforce oxi uh, oxidized conditions or reduce conditions. And uh, I also added a, um, a dried powder of algae, which I collected from the site, to the uh, reactor periodically to simulate the input of uh, algal matter to the sediment. And uh, I ran this for 77 days, um, monitoring EH conditions, pH conditions, temperature, and uh, taking samples for aqueous analysis and solid phase analysis. So a few results. What we're looking at here is the time series of the experiment and concentrations of, uh, of various different species. Uh, the white panels represent oxic periods where I was spar sparging with air, and the gray panels represent um, anoxic periods where I was sparging with nitrogen and carbon dioxide. And what we see is a kind of a classic uh, redox sequence where energetically efficient electron acceptors are used by the microbial community first, so uh, oxygen, then nitrate, uh, then manganese, then iron, and eventually sulfate. Um, and uh, we can see that those, uh, that succession is replicated cycle after cycle. And we can see from the timing of the release of phosphorus, which is released under reducing conditions, uh, and then re-immobilized under oxidizing conditions, that it happens simultaneously with the release of iron, um, which indicates at a um, mineralogical control. The other thing that's interesting is we measure two different types of phosphorus. The total phosphorus, which includes organic phosphorus, and um, the uh, soluble reactive phosphorus, which is similar to orthophosphate. And um, almost all of the phosphorus released occurred as orthophosphate. So what's happening then to all this organic phosphorus that's being uh, deposited in the system? Uh, it's occurring uh, as various different, in various different structures as phosphorus, um, uh, phosphomonoesters, diesters, uh, pyrophosphate, um, 
and it's being broken down by soil enzymes. So, uh, or so sed sediment uh, uh, bacteria in the sediment are releasing enzymes out into the soil environment. And so I measured uh, repeatedly under at the end of each oxidizing cycle and reducing cycle in the reactor, the activity of these different enzymes, which are quite specific to different structures of uh, organic phosphorus, uh, the, how their activities changed. And what we found is that was dependent on redox conditions, and that under oxidizing conditions, there was significantly more activity towards organic phosphorus than there was under reducing conditions. And this trend wasn't shown, for instance, if we look at enzymes responsible for uh, cellulose degradation. So what can I conclude, really, from this small part of the study I've been able to show you? Um, one, that the legacy phosphorus in sediments is mostly inorganic, and that phosphorus mobility is controlled by mineralogy. Uh, principally by the iron oxides. Uh, there's quite a bit more evidence for that than I've been able to show today. Uh, that two, the organic phosphorus breakdown to phosphate is very rapid in the sediments when you compare that to uh, rates which have been shown in the literature in lake sediments. Um, and that it's strongly controlled by redox conditions. And so thirdly, the bioturbation, which repeatedly reoxidizes reduced sediment, probably accelerates the breakdown of organic phosphorus to phosphate uh, because the breakdown of organic P is faster under oxidizing conditions. So I'd like to acknowledge uh, the CERC for funding, uh, the Royal Botanical Gardens um, for site access and also quite a lot of helpful tips about the site and various people at the University of Waterloo for their uh, help in the lab on the project. Um, he will quite happily take any questions. <laughs> Thanks, Chris. Any question for Chris? Sure. Uh, absolutely wonderful. My question, did you actually look at the speciation of the clay mineralogy and the clay fraction of the sediments? And if so, what species did you encounter? It's mostly elite. Uh, actually, I have a, I think I've got a ninja slide for that. Yeah, I do. Uh, <laughs> so uh, we did do um, quantitative phase analysis with the XRD and then uh, Reitfeld analysis to determine the proportions. And uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's mostly elite, if I remember correctly. So would you be willing to run your reactor again with a quantity of elite in it? Or do you use, yeah. uh, use glutite? Uh, no, I used uh, natural sediments. So um, what we actually see in the sequential extractions is that there's um, a real change in the iron-bound pool of uh, phosphorus over time. If you look at uh, most of the different um, mineralogical pools that would retain phosphorus, they're pretty much constant in terms of easily absorbed um, appetite associated or detrital. They're pretty much constant the whole time. But we do see a massive fluctuation in the iron-bound, and then that gets redistributed to the um, uh, easily exchangeable uh, and aqueous pools uh, during the cycling. But uh, what's your thinking for looking at the clay? Well, we're doing a lot of work with that mm -hmm. in terms of the, soil, the actual soil that's being eroded in the agricultural setting. And uh, the, uh, the whole model that we're building has illite and it has goodite in it as well. Okay. The issue here is more, I've always argued for more study on the kinetics, the speed of the reaction. And I'm really fascinated by what you're seeing because it confirms so many things. Uh, we have a couple of um, options for the organic matter concentrations because there is a very phosphorus-rich issue in the like, Holland Marsh, for instance, for instance yep. in a very organic setting, but it's over top of a, of a tight substrate uh, where there is a significant issue with the Cook's Bay part of, uh, of Lake Simcoe. So um, there's a lot of application we'll have to talk later. About yeah, perhaps we can talk during the poster. Great. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks again, Chris. We will move for the next speaker.